Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Buckley program, I'll just say a quick word about us. Uh, the Buckley program is the only group at Yale committed to promoting intellectual diversity here on campus. Uh, we accomplish this goal in a number of ways, including firing line debates, seminars, uh, lectures, our annual conference, and an annual disinvitation dinner. Uh, you can learn more about us uh, or apply to be a student fellow if you haven't yet on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Uh, now to introduce our guest. Yuval Levin is the founding editor of National Affairs and director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Levin served as a member of the White House domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush and was executive director of the President's Council on Bioethics. He's the author of several books on political theory and public policy, most recently, The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in the Age of Individualism. Dr. Levin's current scholarship focuses on the ongoing decay of American institutions and in early 2020, he will publish his next book, A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuval Levin. Hi everybody, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be back at Yale. This, this is the, uh, the, the second in a series of three lectures. I actually see some people who were here at the first one, which is a good sign. Uh, didn't know what to expect on that front. Um, it is, in, in, in being the second of three, it is a kind of middle child, and so uh, is a little self-conscious about where it fits in, I say as a middle child myself. Um, and um, I'll try to keep it from getting too grumpy, but it is, in a sense, uh, in the middle of something. These three talks are intended to form one uh, larger argument, uh, the argument of the, of the book you just heard mentioned, but they're also intended to stand independently, and I certainly wouldn't expect uh, anyone here now either to have been here last time or to remember what I said last time. Um, and so I, I'll, I'm going to start out by just briefly sort of sketching for you uh, a couple of things that I mentioned a month ago that might be relevant here, but then uh, the, the, the lecture will stand on its own as a way of thinking about some key institutions in contemporary American life and what they have to do with the strange kind of uh, social crisis and political crisis that we confront in America uh, in this era. That lecture a month ago was in some ways about the, the nature of that crisis uh, and how it relates to the state of our institutions. I tried to lay out historically and, and in terms of political theory and philosophy uh, what the term institution really means, what institutions do, and then to trace out the sources of a very widespread loss of confidence or trust in institutions in American life over the last half century or so. Um, what I'll talk about today is in a sense more practical uh, and less theoretical. We'll look at some examples, some key institutions in our society and trace a particular kind of dysfunction that runs now through a lot of them and that has a lot to do, I think, with the sorry state of our culture and our politics in ways that might not be obvious but might turn out to help us understand uh, our political life a little bit better. That, that kind of dysfunction um, is something I started to sketch out in, uh, in the last of these. We'll find that in one area after another of American life, people have moved from thinking uh, about institutions as fundamentally molds of their character, that is that they exist to shape them, uh, to form their character and to, and to structure their behavior, to now increasingly thinking of institutions as platforms for themselves, as ways of displaying themselves, being seen in the world, something to stand on top of rather than something to be shaped by. And I'll lay out what, that, what I mean by that, but the difference it makes is quite enormous. Um, there are a lot of examples we could think about because I think this trend is really something that's happening in a lot of our institutions now. But I've got a few in mind that I hope might be particularly uh, I enlightening on the general pattern and maybe interesting. We'll start from our political institutions, um, which can really show us how this distinction between mold and platform or between formative and performative institutions plays out in practice. We'll think about the profession of journalism in America, um, where this is happening as well. We'll think about an institution that all of you certainly know a lot better than I do, the university, and how this pattern, this trend, plays out in, uh, in academic life. And then we'll think a little bit about um, some of the most deeply formative institutions in our society, and especially the institution of the family, uh, 
and think about how uh, this plays out there as well. And in looking at each of these, um, obviously there's an enormous amount to say about each of these institutions in American life, and by no means do I intend to suggest that these are uh, complete pictures of the state of politics, journalism, the academy, the family. But what I do hope we'll begin to see are some ways that applying an institutional lens, thinking about these institutions by, by looking at how they've been transforming, can help us understand the broader state of our society. Because this is a time when it's awfully hard to understand that broader state of our society. If you watch the news for too long, and I don't recommend it, you'll, you'll be left thinking that we're living in the middle of a crazy circus. And in some ways we are. But I think there are patterns to the kinds of dysfunction that we find, and that these patterns um, have something to teach us. So let's start with an example that I myself have seen close up over the years, th the effects of this kind of gradual transformation of expectations and attitudes on our system of government, on our constitution, on Congress, on the presidency, on the courts. The, the public's confidence in all three of those institutions has been plummeting for some time. For a while it seemed like the courts were immune to that, uh, to that collapse of trust, but that's no longer the case, at least in public opinion. And so the public's confidence in our constitutional system is at a low ebb, and it makes sense to try to think about why. Um, and so we'll begin there, and we'll start with Congress, because the Constitution starts with Congress, and because in a lot of ways the institutional decay in our system of government has been evident first and foremost in the functioning or dysfunctioning of the U.S. Congress. The legislative branch not only is the first branch of our system, but it was certainly expected by the framers of the Constitution to be the heart and soul of that system. In fact, if anything, they worried that Congress would be too strong, too assertive. James Madison, in particular, thought that any Republican form of government would always be subject to the excesses of legislative dominance. The legislative branch, Madison wrote in Federalist 48, would always be, quote, extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex. In Federalist 51, he says, this is the reason for the bicameral legislature, to keep the legislature from becoming too strong and so the executive from becoming too weak. That sounds to us like a very strange thing to worry about. Uh, the idea that the legislature would be too strong in our system of government and that the president would be too weak seems like Madison must have had his worries inverted. We now in modern America and for some time have worried about the rise of the imperial executive, about the rise of the administrative state, uh, about the rise of uh, judicial activism, all at the expense of Congress. And those worries are justified. Presidential power certainly has ballooned over the years and, and, and so is the role of the courts. But I think that we tend to underplay the degree to which that has happened as the result of willful congressional dereliction and how this has transformed the character of Congress as an institution in our politics. Sometimes that kind of dereliction is a very simple matter. Members of Congress don't want to make hard choices, don't want to bear the responsibility for trade-offs, and so they keep the easy stuff for themselves and they let the president or sometimes judges make the tough calls. That means passing very vague legislation so that sets out popular general goals and then leaving it to the executive branch to figure out the details of how to achieve those goals, leaving it to judges to sort out the mess that always results. And we can see that pattern in the last few years in healthcare and in education, in environmental policy, really across the full range of policy issues. It's very much a bipartisan vice. I, I served as a White House policy staffer in the George W. Bush administration. I can certainly tell you a lot of stories about members of Congress asking us to do things that they could easily have done themselves. Um, but didn't want to bear the blame if things went wrong. And that over the years uh, from both parties, Congresses of both parties, presidents of both parties, has transformed our system of government some. But sometimes, and especially lately, that dereliction of congressional responsibility has been a little more complicated and can run deeper to the core of the institutional confusion in the contemporary Congress. A lot of members of Congress have come to view the institution as a kind of platform for themselves, as a way to raise their profile, to become celebrities in the world of cable news or talk radio, in essence to perform. That's their core understanding of what the job is. And what's lost in the process is the capacity to legislate, to deliberate, 
to compromise. Members come to see themselves as players in a larger political ecosystem, the point of which is not legislating exactly or governing, but a kind of performative outrage for a partisan audience that's asking them to put on the show. Their incentives are rooted in that understanding of their role, and so they're not really fundamentally about legislating. There are a lot of examples that I could offer you. A, a couple are very obvious and come straight to mind. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, uh, a young Democratic congresswoman from New York, has offered us an example of this uh, since she was elected in 2018. She's proven very adept at getting attention, not only by outraging Republicans through really expert trolling, um, but also by using her fellow Democrats as kind of props in a morality tale about corruption and incumbency, uh, intended for her own party's most energetic activists. Josh Croucher, a journalist at National Journal, uh, wrote in 2019 that this kind of behavior involves, quote, garnering her limitless national attention at the expense of more mundane congressional work, end quote. That is just about the pattern that you find across the Congress now. I'll give you a Republican example, too. Matt Gates, who is a now second-term Republican congressman from Florida, has made a name for himself as a very quotable defender of President Trump on cable television. Uh, he'll go on to talk about any controversy, anything they'd like. He has a strong opinion about it. When a reporter from BuzzFeed asked him about a year ago whether he was concerned that he was gaining notoriety instead of prominence by doing this, Gates said this, I quote, What's the difference? People have to know who you are and what you're doing if your opinions are going to matter. Now, I think it's hard to imagine a clear illustration of the ways in which members of Congress have changed their attitude about the institution than that very frank statement. Congress, like any serious institution, functions by socializing its members to work together so that when those members see the institution as a stage for their individual performances, they don't become socialized to work together and they're left in a kind of antisocial form, each trying to shine over the others. The result of that as a practical matter is that they act like outsiders commenting on Congress rather than acting like insiders composing the Congress. And that makes accommodations and bargains and deals, which is, after all, their job, uh, very hard to come by. It makes legislating very difficult and, therefore, very rare. I think it has everything to do with why so little gets done in Congress at this point and why every budget process seems to end with the threat of a shutdown and very little else goes on. This is made worse, it seems to me, by the loss of protected spaces for private deliberation in Congress. Every institution needs an inner life, a kind of sanctum where it can really do its work. And Congress over time has lost that inner life as all of its deliberative spaces have become performative spaces. Everything now is televised and there's less and less room and time for talking in private. Now obviously this has been done in the name of transparency and transparency is a good thing generally speaking. Without transparency, institutions that serve a public purpose easily can become debased and distorted, disconnected, unaccountable. There's no shortage of evidence for that, and there are reasons to demand transparency in Congress. But every good thing is a matter of degree. And in politics, we've treated transparency as a good thing with no costs, when in fact I think that it can have some enormous costs. And these ultimately have to be accounted for in the balance of judgment. The result of this is that increasingly Congress has the appearance of a show, because everything it does more or less is a show. It's fully transparent so that there's no distinction between the inside of the institution and the outside of the institution. And it's very, very hard to bargain in the open. Nobody can really do that. If you want to reach an agreement between a union and management, you don't do it out in public. You just don't. And the fact that it's done in a closed room does not mean that it's corrupt. It means that people need the space, the room to bargain to make deals, to make compromises. In Congress now, there's very, very little room to do that. The very few places that remain private are basically the leadership offices at midnight when there's a budget deadline. And that's where all the work gets done because the work is inevitably going to get done wherever there is some privacy for bargaining and compromise. I think everyone can see that there's a problem with Congress. Members are dissatisfied. They're not happy with how the institution works. And voters are dissatisfied. A public approval of Congress often now is in the single digits. Uh, we're down to friends and relatives of members. So, the, the, well, yeah, exactly, not even all the relatives, right? 
so I, I do think there's an opening for genuine institutional reform. But it would need to start with an understanding of the problem. And so with a revitalized sense of Congress as a discrete and formative institution itself. Formative, that is, of its members. The kind of institutional identity and ambition could help members see that a stronger Congress is in their interest. They need to demand that Congress have its proper place in the system. And for that, they need to want that. And it demands something of them, a certain way of working that right now is not what members are after. So that it seems to me that at the core of our constitutional trouble at this point is a weak Congress. And at the core of that is the sad fact that the members of Congress want it to be weak. And that's what needs to change in order for the institution and therefore the system to find its way uh, back to health. The, the absence of genuinely institutional ambition of people who think of themselves as members of Congress is an enormous problem for the constitutional system now and has to be the focus of efforts to strengthen that system. And in some ways, the same is becoming true of the presidency. Uh, I think it, it, it might seem strange to say so because we're not used to thinking of the executive branch as lacking ambition under any president. But I think it has come to lack a genuinely constitutional ambition in a way that's highly relevant to this broader problem that I'm, that I'm tracing out for you. Our presidents, like a lot of members of Congress, now too often also see themselves as outsiders yelling about the government more than as insiders wielding power. And this has become especially clear under President Trump, though I would say it began well before uh, his presidency. The Trump presidency has made the problem clearer than it has been because in some ways Donald Trump in an unusually explicit way approaches politics in performative theatrical terms. He exhibits an ambition to put himself at the center of our national consciousness, the center of our attention, and even more than to use the actual institutional powers of the presidency to pursue traditional policy goals. And he expresses himself almost always as an outside voice speaking at and not through or for the institutions of government. His actions in office are generally not traditional uses of government power or institutional action. They've instead been understood as kind of turns in the plot and uh, turns in the drama of our politics aimed at driving the story, especially the cable news story. That's in part, I think, because President Trump has not been subject, as all of his predecessors were, to the formative shaping power of our political institutions. Every past president has been formed by a set of institutions, either as a, as a senior military officer or much more frequently as a government official in some other office before the presidency, that had shaped his understanding of how to act effectively as the head of the executive branch. Donald Trump is the first American president who has not been shaped by any experience in any such institution. His life experience has involved running a family business in real estate and then becoming a kind of professional celebrity, basically playing the part of a successful real estate developer in American popular culture. He entered politics as another performance in that role and he was elevated to the presidency because he was very good at that role. Um, and, and successful at it. His formative institutional experiences, therefore, shaped him to thrive in an era of politics as entertainment. In just about every setting, he's been acting for an audience. In the presidency, no less than while running for president. And that helps explain, I think, some of the obsession with ratings and audience size, the kind of running commentary on Twitter. There's even this tendency to comment on his own speeches as he delivers them, which I think is very entertaining, but it's very unusual. Uh, he, he also behaves like an outsider and so neglects the responsibilities of the insider. We can find him a lot of the time on social media complaining about something the Justice Department has done. In other words, something his own administration has done and echoing the terms and the sentiments of media analysts as though he were just another observer, another commentator. The trouble is not that the president has a grand sense of himself and his office. That's always been with us. But the perception of the presidency as a kind of platform, a stage occupied by an outsider speaking at and about our system of government rather than through or for it, a kind of commentator in chief more than a political actor is I think a newer and a more ominous phenomenon. As I say, there were signs of it in, in, in previous presidencies. We've also seen this pattern of behavior in campaigns for a long time, including in presidential campaigns. I think it wouldn't be hard to show 
that a significant number of the people who ran for president since the beginning of the 21st century in both parties entered the primaries basically to raise their media profiles, to get a book deal, to get a better spot on cable without actually expecting to win the election and govern. Like a lot of members of Congress, they approached politics as a path to prominence and to visibility. But the, the problem is mounted with time. It's grown worse. And it's contributed to a transformation of the character of our national politics. The barriers between politics and entertainment have become blurred in some disorienting ways as a result of that. I'll give you one telling example of this pattern from last year, from the summer of 2018. Um, it, it happened at a, at a Trump rally in Florida. The president was delivering his usual kind of rally speech. And a CNN reporter named Jim Acosta, who was a frequent hostile critic of Trump's, was speaking live on the air when behind him a group of, of rally attendees were basically screaming epithets at him, um, making wild gestures, maybe threatening gestures behind him on camera. And Acosta seemed taken aback by this, maybe even uh, felt threatened by it. But as a bunch of journalists who were there later noted, after Acosta's on-air appearance ended and he walked off the CNN camera stand, some of the same rally attendees who had been attacking him from behind approached him to shake his hand, to get his autograph, to take selfies with him, and he obliged. He did that with them. Both the Costa and these protesters, and the president too in some ways, had been acting their parts in this dramatic scene. And at some level they all grasped that they were acting a part, and they could implicitly acknowledge it when it was over. The dynamic here is a little bit like a, like a WWE wrestling match. It's an event made to look like an athletic competition, but which in fact is partially scripted and entirely performative. Our national politics in the 21st century increasingly has fallen into this kind of pattern, and it's proven more and more difficult to distinguish between fact and fiction, between reality and scripted drama in politics. Partisan observers, voters, and citizens have been willing to play a kind of frantic, angry role in this drama alongside the entertainer politicians. And they're not just pretending, they really are angry, and they're eager to see how the people on the stage do, but they're partially pretending. At least most of them are. Now and then somebody's gonna turn out to have not been in on the joke, uh, and so could be moved by what he sees on cable news to fire a handgun at members of Congress playing baseball or to turn up at, at a pizzeria in Washington with a rifle but most of the time, the rest of us seem to do a little better at distinguishing the most outlandish kinds of conspiracies and provocations from real outrages. I do think it gets harder and harder all the time to tell the difference between what's meant to be taken seriously and what's not. And that is not a healthy turn in our politics. The, the moral logic of reality television increasingly defines the political arena. What we're seeing is real, but it's also being put on for show at the same time. And of course, reality television is how President Trump became really a household name. He has been at home in that genre for a long time, while the rest of us are only now getting used to it. And rather than being shaped by the contours of the presidency, taking its shape to advance an agenda, he's tended to use it as a platform for a kind of reality television performance. His ambition has been directed to making himself the most visible player in the drama of our wall-to-wall -wall culture war, filling a lot of space in our national consciousness, but at the same time also leaving a kind of void in our constitutional system. It's the same pattern that we find in Congress. The institution isn't doing its job, but it is doing a different job. It's serving as a stage for a kind of political performance art. The third branch of our government, the judiciary, exhibits some of the same problems. As I say, it's been slower to move in this direction, and in some respects, therefore, has been slower to lose the trust of the public. But we've seen a little more of the same. I'll say a little bit less about this one in the interest of time, but I'd only say that a meaningful portion of the problem that we've tended to describe as judicial activism is actually a form of this broader transformation of attitudes, so that some judges have come to think of the bench as a stage and of their work as a kind of moralistic performance. It's not hard to see. You can read the, the, the Supreme Court opinions in any of the major cases, the kind of politically notable cases of the past decade or two, and you, you'll find an awful lot of posturing. I'll give you a quote. Marriage responds to the universal fear that a lonely person might call out only to find no one there. 
It offers the hope of companionship and understanding and assurance that while both still live, there will be someone to care for the other. That's what the court said at the opening of the Obergefell decision a couple of years ago. It's nice, right? But it's not jurisprudence. Uh, it, it's not rooted in some theory about the proper constitutional role of the judge either. So what is it? It's in many cases, for a lot of judges now, it is a kind of virtue signaling. It is a kind of performance. That happens in decisions that I like and in decisions that I don't like. It happens in decisions that, that are thought of as coming from the right and from the left. The courts have been more resistant to these trends than other institutions. They've also kept some closed rooms for themselves, some real sanctums where they can deliberate. They continue to appeal to an ideal of integrity that is, I think, fundamentally institutional in character. But they are undeniably moving in the direction of the performative approach to their work, just as Congress has, just as the presidency has, and with the same sort of character. And the trouble with the courts, I think, has to be understood in part as a facet of that larger problem. In our institutions of government, in the branches of the constitutional system, this problem, this increasingly performative approach to governing, has grown very pervasive. And it's worth noticing that among its most foremost consequences is not only to make our governing institutions less focused on their constitutional purposes, it's also to make them more like one another. They all come to be engaged in the same performative enterprise. They all compete with each other on that field, on the field of the culture war, rather than on the field that is set out for their competition and cooperation by the Constitution. The institutions that are better suited for performative flourishing, the presidency especially, and to a lesser extent the courts, are going to dominate in this kind of situation. While Congress, which is unkempt, which is cacophonous, which is of just a bunch of people, uh, you know, 435 car dealers, uh, is going to do less well in this kind of situation than presidents and judges will be able to do. But in the process, all of the institutions are going to lose their distinct character, their distinct purposes, their distinct forms of ambition, modes of integrity. This is a problem that we can trace throughout our political culture now and that we can also trace well beyond the political sphere. It's happening uh, across the, the entire array of elite institutions and many non-elite institutions in American life. And I think it's become a particularly acute problem <coughs> where integrity is most essential. Some of our institutions derive their purpose, uh, their very significance, especially from their ability to guarantee some degree of integrity in the work of the people within them. That's often especially true when it comes to the professions as institutions. The lawyer, the doctor, the nurse, the teacher, the scientist, these are human types that we think of with respect because the work they do is guided by certain kinds of institutional forms and boundaries. The journalist, too, very much falls into this category. And we can think about the, the situation of contemporary journalism as an example of what's going on in a number of professions. American journalism, maybe political journalism in particular, is clearly in some kind of crisis today. That would be hard to deny. And yet it's not in crisis in every respect. The demand for political journalism is certainly on the rise as interest in politics has been soaring in the Trump years. The supply of journalism has also been pretty plentiful. The quality of it obviously varies because of the immense diversity of sources of information we have, but I think it's on par with any golden age of journalism that we might point to. The economics of journalism have been tough, <clears throat> but people are finding ways to live with them. The freedom of the press is not really in jeopardy now. So what is the problem? The crisis that confronts American journalism now is a crisis of public confidence, a crisis of integrity and trust. Trust in journalism is extremely low having fallen along with confidence in many, in many other institutions. And the populist mood of our politics expresses itself particularly in mistrust of the press. From the president on down, you find people taking the, the, the political press to stand in for the establishment and putting fake news at the heart of their description of the kind of social order that they reject. And all of this is a particular problem for journalism because trust is, after all, the basic currency of journalism. Journalism exists to convey information. It can't do its job if it doesn't have the trust of its audience. And it's also uniquely subject to the effects of some important technological innovations in recent years, especially to the rise of social media. In fact, I think that it's the internet and social media, maybe more than any other factor, that have sped the transformation of American journalism 
along the path that we've just seen in Congress and in the presidency and in the courts, the path from a, a mold institution to a platform institution. By multiplying and fragmenting sources of information, the web and social media have turned the products of journalism into artifacts of self-expression for different forms of Americans. People filter and select among news sources and then distribute the work of the ones they choose among their kind of virtual circles. And by providing powerful independent platforms for dissemination, social media in particular have turned a lot of journalists from participants in the work of institutions to managers of personal brands who carefully tend to their own public presence and presentation. Even reporters from major national newspapers and television networks, people whose formal professional work is subject to layers of editing and verification, now have a constant personal presence on Twitter and other social networks. And they offer up both reporting and commentary in an ongoing way, apart from the work they do officially, formally, for newspapers or, or, or cable news. That makes it very hard to distinguish the work of individuals from the work of institutions. And increasingly, it turns journalistic institutions into platforms for the personal brands of individual journalists, just as Congress has become a platform for its individual members. These trends feed into a kind of self-intensifying cycle that build up mistrust, that undermines standards, that makes it hard to compare reliability between different institutions, and leaves the public understandably skeptical about the integrity of contemporary journalism. And it contributes to real, genuine institutional failures, failures to enforce journalistic standards, to resist different kinds of political hysterias, to appropriately restrain the power of the press. And these then further contribute to public cynicism about journalism. In the terms that I've been laying out for you here, we could say that an important reason for the continuing decline of trust in the press is the failure of a lot of journalists to treat journalism itself as a formative institution that should shape their work their inclination instead to treat it as another platform for themselves. To grasp the formative potential of their profession would mean that journalists would, would have to see that their institutions are valued not only for the work they produce, but for the ethic that they engender, and so also for the attitudes and the behaviors that they encourage journalists to exhibit. Like the scientific method, the forms of journalistic ethics constitute a kind of paradoxical balancing act a way to invest individuals' pride in what amounts to an organized display of humility. It's an extraordinary institutional achievement of journalism as a profession and not one to be dismissed lightly. And that means that among other things, journalists should be particularly careful to avoid the culture of individual celebrity in American life, which is the very opposite of the culture of institutional integrity. But on cable news and on Twitter and elsewhere, prominent journalists now spend many hours every day essentially becoming celebrities on their own. Journalists who are inclined to complain about President Trump's behavior should consider whether what Trump is doing relative to what the presidency is supposed to be might be unnervingly similar to what a lot of leading political reporters are doing relative to what journalism is supposed to be. Both are playing out a self-indulgent celebrity version of the real thing, and in both cases that renders them less able to do their actual work. When we forget that journalism, what journalism as an institution is for and how it could serve its purpose with integrity and so shape journalists to be trustworthy, we risk losing the service that it provides our society and replacing it with just another stage for celebrity performance. We, and we have more than enough of those. The importance of protecting social forms that help us seek the truth with integrity can also take us another step away from politics and toward the heart of the life of our society. One of the core institutions of Western civilization for a thousand years now has been intended precisely to serve that kind of purpose, to serve the quest for truth, to protect that search while also shaping it to be trustworthy, to provide a venue for it, and to guarantee its vitality and integrity. The university is a core institution of our society, and it's a model of how institutions both perform a role and form people within them to develop a certain character. But I think we're seeing the same kind of pattern in the university as we now see in politics and in their professions. Endless barrels of ink have been spilled to articulate that problem. And most of you, almost by definition, are going to know more about life in the university than I will. So my point here is not to offer an analysis of everything that's happening on campus, but to take up a small portion of the question from a particular angle. Because I think the lens that I'm trying to propose here for understanding the state of our core institutions has something to tell us about the state of the contemporary academy, too. 
in a way, the, the university in America has always been shaped by an argument about its purpose. What is the point of the institution? An educational institution, certainly, and so it's hard to deny that its purpose is formative, to form students. Surely it exists somehow to shape the elite, at least, among the younger generation. But what shape is it supposed to give that elite? And to what end? For what purpose? I think we can divide the answers to that question into roughly three camps, three sets of ideas about what the university is for. The first would say that the university exists above all to give people the skills that our economy requires. Almost two centuries ago, Alexis de Tocqueville was struck by the degree to which Americans tended to emphasize that goal of higher education. And it's still, I think, what Americans who go to college mostly want out of it and mostly get out of it. Champions of this view want the institution to turn students into professionals in various fields, to infuse them with the knowledge and the character that each profession requires. A second camp would say that the university exists to give people a consciousness of the moral demands of a just society. We might think about this as a newer idea of the purpose of the university, but actually I think it's an older idea of the purpose of the university. This was the original purpose of the university in America in particular to train men of religion to move that larger society to repent of its sins and seek redemption. But from the start, in universities like this one, this somewhat puritanical, moralistic mission was also commingled with the cause of legitimating the moral impulses of the American elite, and so of teaching a rising generation of elites to conform to the culture that they were maturing into and inheriting. And this, too, remains a driving purpose of many in American higher education. Now largely shorn of its religious roots, it looks like campus political activism that demands repentance for some national sins carefully selected to legitimate and justify the moral impulses of America's elite culture, which now is largely a progressive liberal culture. And the third camp would say that the purpose of the university is to expose a rising generation to the deepest and the best of the wisdom of our civilization, seeking the truth wherever it leads, uncovering reality without regard for either economic or political usefulness. That's been a core purpose of the academy ever since Plato first coined that term to name his school, and it often goes now under the heading of liberal education. These three visions amount, I think, to three intermingled cultures within the modern university, a culture of professional development, a culture of moral activism, and a culture of liberal education. They're distinguishable, though they've always interacted in the American university, and individual academics often are engaged in more than one at a time. And they are all formative. That is, they view the university as forming students. But today, the culture of moral activism has become hyperactive in the university, and in a way that I think is very much connected to the trends that I've been trying to trace for you in other institutions. It still exists to remind our society of its sins and to justify and drive conformity to some of the mores of our elites, which today means conformity to a certain kind of progressive liberalism. But it does so in a way that's become increasingly unmoored from the fundamental purpose and identity of the university as a whole. Its methods are, are, are increasingly not educational but coercive, not inquisitive but declarative, not so much formative as performative. Of the three cultures that compose the university, the culture of moral activism is inherently the most performative, and so is the one best suited to thrive in an environment that treats institutions as platforms. And it doesn't only thrive in this kind of condition, it dominates. And as in Congress and in journalism and elsewhere, the practitioners of this new kind of academic performance art seem to see themselves as acting on a broader societal stage that's not fundamentally about the university, and so is not defined or bounded by the institution's character or purposes. The trouble is not that they're trying to form their students. Certainly they're doing that. They're masters of formative social pressure. But the trouble is that they are not themselves formed by the structure and the aims and character of the institution they're part of. They're not formed by the academy, and so don't allow their ambitions to be molded by its distinct shape and channeled through it. They act not so much in the university as on it, again, behaving like outsiders, and so neglecting some core responsibilities. And the moral vision that today's academic activists advance is also not well suited to a regard for institutions. The identity politics that increasingly pervades their teachings tends to deny the very possibility of moral formation, taking as it does some basic biological characteristics or even ethnic roots to be determinative of human possibilities, in some respects even of civic or moral worth. This means that the endeavors of, of today's activists tend to deform the academy 
to turn it into another stage for individual moralistic performance art, like so many of our other major institutions. Among its other consequences, this kind of politicization of the university tends to collapse the distinctions amongst, among different academic institutions and between the university and other institutions in our society. That's what the move from mold to platform does, not only among universities, but among all of our institutions, as they all come to be understood as platforms and in the service of a fundamentally political performance, the distinctions between them and their different purposes begin to fade and our social life comes to be flattened and thinned. That's an essential part of what we've been witnessing in this century in America, a flattening of the topography of our social life by a kind of hyper-aggressive cultural politics. Every institution is becoming an arena for the same kind of combat. And this is particularly destructive for those institutions whose formative purpose is foremost and decidedly not political, the institutions of community and of family above all. We end with family and community because the social crisis that's rending our society begins there and solutions have to begin there too. But we've gotten there by thinking through politics and the professions and the academy to see how the forces that are bearing down on the family and community have come to be shaped by the larger culture war that shaped our society. To see institutions as platforms for performance is to deny them their role as molds of character and implicitly to deny our very need for the kind of formation that our institutions offer. And much of our culture, I think, does deny that need now. Both the libertarian and the progressive ideals of freedom assume a human person already fully formed, requiring only liberation from oppression of various sorts in order to be free. Progressivism in particular is much more at home with an idea of performative institutions that let us be who we are than formative institutions that take crooked, fallen, raw material and mold it into human beings and citizens. In this crucial sense, I think the distinction between formative and performative institutions is not functional or just structural. It's a moral and philosophical distinction. An ideal of formative institutions assumes a human person that begins imperfect and unformed. That ideal, therefore, comes loaded with a set of assumptions with very deep roots in our civilization, that we're all born imperfect but capable of moral improvement, that that kind of improvement happens soul by soul and so can't really be circumvented by social transformation, and that this improvement, the formation of character and virtue, is the foremost work of our society in every generation. This vision of the human person and the purpose of society is fundamental to Western civilization, but it has now become very controversial. And the assault upon formative institutions in our time has everything to do with just how controversial it has become. It's why we find battles raging around every one of the core formative institutions of our society, family, faith, work, civil society, the academy, and our republican form of government. Of these, the family is foremost and is therefore also most controversial. We know that people need thriving families. No one in any corner of our politics really denies that. But when we forget the family's formative purpose, the ways it shapes our souls, we can persuade ourselves that we need thriving families for basically practical, maybe even economic reasons, so that the form of the family is not essential to its function. The family itself, therefore, comes to be used as a platform for political activism. It comes to be seen as another venue for scoring points in the cultural battles of our time, another proving ground for ideology, rather than the essential, irreplaceable forge and foundry of the next generation. This, in turn, distorts our understanding of the families that we each are part of and makes it easier to neglect our obligations as insiders in those families, a failure of responsibility that's all too familiar throughout our various institutions. And in the case of the family, the mistake is especially costly, robbing too many Americans of the opportunity for a strong start in life. We can make similar mistakes when we forget the essentially formative function of our other institutions, economic or religious, academic or civic. <coughs> when we think that all of these are just there to serve as platforms for us, to meet our desire to be seen and noticed and approved of, we forget their distinct purposes and we forget our own distinct neediness. And when we grow forgetful of those, we're left wondering why so many of us are lonely or frustrated, despairing or alienated, why we seem so disconnected, why we're restless and resentful. When we forget why we need institutions, none of this makes sense. And that's why we have to remember institutions and why we have to invest ourselves in them. This is what the social crisis we confront in America now 
a crisis of dissolution, breakdown, and disconnectedness looks like when we see it through the lens of some key institutions. It suggests that we've forgotten or that we willfully ignore what institutions do for us and why we need them, and that a lot of the problems that define our age of frustration and dysfunction result from our, from our desire to use institutions as stages upon which to perform rather than to allow them to be molds of our character. To see this problem work its way through the institutions of our government, our economy, our culture, our communities and families is to see that it is a very broad and deep problem. It's a daunting problem. But to see it this way is also to see that it is a problem we can begin to address by approaching the institutions around us, the ones within our reach, and some are within everyone's reach, with a different frame of mind. And so seeing the problem this way should encourage us to see that things can be improved, that renewal is possible and that we each are in a position to take on that work where we are. This is where, we, this is where we're headed in the third and final of these lectures next month, toward ways forward that might become clearer by understanding and articulating more precisely just what institutions do for us. But for the moment, it's worth our while to see how this particular pattern has worked its way through so many of our institutions, how over and over we find insiders acting like outsiders, we find responsibility and authority traded for visibility and prominence, with the result being a desperate shortage of legitimacy and solidarity. I think it's another way, another angle to thinking about the kinds of challenges that our society faces now, the challenges that our politics is finding it so hard to work through, the challenges that have been distorting our common life together, making it hard for people to understand each other, to communicate, to share a set of facts in common. This, is, this kind of institutional deformation is one cause of that larger problem. And seeing it more clearly might help us see the others and might help us find a way forward. I'll end there. Thank you. Any questions? Any question, just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic around. Start here. Sure. Thank you. And just to warm up. The implication of your critique on institutions is that they should be formative and not a place to stand up and perform. In a society, I'm thinking of the gray flannel suit 50s and conformity. Yeah. In that kind of, even before my time, in that kind of society, where is the opportunity to speak out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. I think it's a very important question. I think there's no doubt that <clears throat> the problem I'm describing is in part the result of a reaction to that America, right? To the America of the gray flannel suit, to the, the American that understood its problem to be excess conformity. Um, and we reacted to that by, we reacted to that by, by liberalizing, by breaking down the, the, the sources, the roots of conformity liberalizing economically, liberalizing socially and culturally. And a lot of that has been for the good. A lot of that has been for the very good, especially for people who are not in positions of power in the America of the 1950s or who would not have been. Um, the trouble is that everything in life is trade-offs. And you can't, you can't engage in that kind of social transformation without taking some account of the costs involved. And I think that we have arrived at a place in 21st century America where a politics of, of liberalization or a politics of liberty um, needs to account for the desire and the need for solidarity. Um, our politics now doesn't have enough of a vocabulary of solidarity and doesn't have enough of a vocabulary of responsibility, of commitment, of obligation, we have a vast vocabulary of rights and choices uh, and freedom. And look, rights and choices and freedom are great. But to have a functional society, I think you need both ends of this. And that means that what we need to see now, the ways in which we need to counterbalance the excesses of our social life today, require us to look for opportunities to revive sources both of solidarity and of responsibility. I, it seems to me that it's often the role of conservatives in a free society to push back against that society where it's leaning too hard. 
And that means that conservatives in American life in the 1950s, early 60s, were basically libertarians, were pushing against an overly conformist society for liberty. I think conservatives in 21st century America very often uh, are more pushing for sources of order and structure and, uh, and commonality and, and solidarity. And you see that in the politics of the right. In some ways, it goes way too far. Um, but the, the, the desire, the need for that, it seems to me, is very real. And so what I'm trying to articulate here is a way of thinking about how to help our politics find its way back in the direction of some solidarity. I think increasingly both the right and the left are looking for a terminology of solidarity. Uh, I think the left is looking for it in socialism, which strikes me as the wrong place to look for it. Um, the right, I mean, God help us, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, I think we can find that vocabulary in a better way by thinking about the sources of social order. And that's why this is a time to be thinking about institutions. Does that help? You're not persuaded. Yeah. Well, I think we I think we have an excessively um, I, I think our picture of the 1950s isn't quite right. The 1950s were a time that actually saw a lot of political activism and uh, and in all directions. In some ways, a lot more than now. Our politics was actually broader and wider in the 1950s um, than it, than it is now. But you know, th there were fewer options in every realm of life, and there was much more of a, of a social consensus at the center than we have now. Other questions? Yeah. Um, related to the idea of uh, politics as entertainment that's become part of our daily lives, I was wondering what you think of the argument um, that comes from a lot of activists that the personal is political, that art, literature, and now even sports are necessarily political in nature, and are arenas for political argument and um, activism? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that there is an important distinction between the personal and the political. Um, I think that politics in a, in a free society exists really to create the conditions, the preconditions, for the personal to flourish. Um, and that means that we shouldn't lose sight of the distinction between the personal and the political. But that does strike me as a different problem than losing sight of the distinction between politics and entertainment, where it becomes very hard to tell what in our political life now is intended to be taken seriously and what is intended to, uh, to rev people up, to get people going. I think it's hard even for the politicians who are doing it to tell. You know, I saw Kevin McCarthy yesterday, the, the, majority, the minority leader of the, of the House, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives, saying that, um, that the, the impeachment process the Democrats are starting is a coup, right? I, Kevin McCarthy doesn't think that. Um, and he, 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 he had sort of come to conceive of, of the role he has as playing into this kind of narrative. And he's just doing it. And you find a lot of politicians engaged that way because it seems like what's required of, of them in the kind of larger... Uh, political theater that they, that they see themselves as part of. You could have a lot of problems with, with the impeachment process starting in the House. I have a lot of problems with it. But it's not a coup, right? And the, the difference between these things matters. I think our politics now has gotten to a place where the people in it, the practitioners of it, are extremely careless about drawing a line between what they actually mean to say and what it seems like people would enjoy hearing. Um, Rediscovering the difference between the two seems to me a very, very important task now for, 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 for a rising generation of politicians. And it's not going to be easy. Uh, thank you for your time, Dr. Levin. So just to touch on a point you mentioned earlier on in the speech when you said that everything, not everything, but a lot of things in Congress get done you know, at night behind closed doors in leadership rooms. I feel like we're feeding into a lot the egos of these congressmen who like the attention. They're almost like children who really didn't, you know, maybe they didn't get enough attention as kids, 
right? Like, what if we just stopped paying attention to Congress? Like, what if we just gave them a year and said, you want to know what? We're not going to pay attention to you guys. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, get stuff done. We'll come and check back on you. Obviously, there's a lot of room for corruption there. Um, but at some level, right, like, we're feeding into this and we're responsible. What if, what if the, what would happen if the media just stopped covering the ridiculous things that congressmen said because they're like, yep, we're tired of this? What do you think what would happen? Well, okay. Um. Let me say a couple of things to that. I, I, it, it, it seems to me that um, in some very important respects, Congress does matter. We should pay attention to Congress. The trouble is that the purpose of Congress is to, is to drive accommodations and compromises in a divided society. That is actually the purpose of Congress. The US Congress is not a, a European parliament. Uh, a, a parlim in a parliamentary system, the legislature exists to enable the majority to get its way. That's what it's for. And the distinctions between the executive and legislative are not as sharp. And you have a majoritarian system. The majority governs. If the electorate's not happy with it at the next elections, a different majority takes over. Our system of government does not work that way. Uh, and w when we think about what's wrong with Congress, I think it's very important to see this distinction. Congress is there in order to compel accommodation and compromise. The assumption was that our society was complicated and would be divided. And the idea behind the structure of the Congress, the fact that there are all these choke points and veto points, the fact that it's so hard to get anything done, that's structural. That's not just a function of today's Congress having trouble. The reason for all that is, is to make sure that any real legislative action required bargaining and compromise. And in today's political environment, that kind of bargaining and compromise is very, very difficult. Part of the reason for that is this, is this blurring of the line between entertainment and politics. Compromise just isn't that entertaining. Um, you know, yelling at each other is much more interesting. Part of that is also the, the fact that, as I said, members of Congress don't have a place to talk. And this is an amazing thing about Congress. I, I worked on the House side in the 1990s, which was not a golden age, believe me. But there was a lot of cross-partisan bargaining in the 1990s in Congress because there was a lot more space to talk than there is now. Um, some of that is because all committee work now is public and televised in a way that even in the 90s it wasn't. Um, part of that is just because members don't see their role as sitting in a, in a room together and talking. That's not how they understand it. I think both of these problems, which are related, are driving a dysfunction in Congress that has a lot to do with what's gone wrong in the institution. So I don't think we can just ignore Congress. I, you know, it does matter, right? I also don't think we can expect members of Congress not to, uh, not to want to be famous and seen and important. That's politicians, right? That's what, it, that, that's what a politician is. That's always been the case. The desire for fame, for renown, is not a new thing in politicians. But we have a system that is reasonably well designed to drive that desire in constructive directions. And that system is not working now. And I think the, the ways to improve it are institutional in the sense that they force us to think about the structure of Congress, about how the, the institution prioritizes different parts of its work. And so what's required, unfortunately, isn't very entertaining. What's required is real institutional reform. And you know, members turn out not to be all that interested in it. There are a lot of good ideas out there coming from all sorts of places uh, about how to fix Congress. What's lacking is a desire to do that by the members of Congress. Uh, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, similar to the previous question about the showmanship of Congress, is the transition to performative aspects of politics leading to a change in the character of those who seek office? Yeah. Or is it more of a case that absolute transparency corrupts absolutely? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think there is a difference. Um, I think there's a difference in a couple of ways. It, I, I, I try not to start sentences with, it used to be, uh, you know, in the good old days. But it used to be that a lot of members of Congress had been state legislators. 
um, and so that they understood themselves to be legislators. And that's not true anymore. Um, very few members of Congress now have a personal history in state legislatures. They tend to be old. Um, and younger members come from different places. They come from the ranks of a certain kind of political activism. They come from, especially on the right, they come from talk radio and from political journalism in a weird way. You know, local, uh, but still performative, we might say. Um, you know, the, the, the sense of what the institution is is naturally going to have a lot to do with who chooses to run. Running for Congress is really hard. Um, it's very unpleasant in a lot of ways. It's, it's hard on your family. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard work. And being in Congress is too. And so um, it takes really motivated people to do it. And that motivation is driven by some sense of what the job is. So I do think that as the nature of the job changes, the nature of the person running also changes. And we've gotten to a place now where there aren't all that many members of Congress who have in mind either a memory or a kind of model of how the institution functioned as, as, a, as a working legislature. Um, I, I don't know where we put the last sort of traditional bipartisan, large bipartisan bill passed in Congress. Maybe it was Medicare modernization in 2003. That's 15, 16 years ago. Um, a lot of the House has turned over since then. Um, and some of the Senate has too. So you don't have a lot of members who saw that kind of process in action. What they've seen is very partisan legislation. And what they've seen is a lot of showmanship. Um, and so there's no question that that has an effect on who chooses to run and on who's in Congress. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your thoughts. Um, I was wondering specifically on the transparency point. It seems yeah. like the course of the 20th century up till now has been a process of continual, uh, in a, a continual attempt to make politics more transparent. And it seems like that's an inherently uh, democratic idea that I get to see what my representative is doing. So how, how, how does one... Um, begin to persuade people that maybe transparency is not such yeah. a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. I would say it hasn't been a, 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 a ratchet in one direction for the entirety of the past century. There was a period in the middle of the 20th century uh, that started really with a, a major reform of Congress in 1946 after the war um, that actually did create certain kinds of boundaries around committee work and I think in a lot of ways was very impressive as a way of thinking about the institution. But since about the 1970s, and especially since Watergate in the middle of the 1970s, there's been enormous pressure for transparency in national politics in general. That's happened in Congress. It's affected the ways that we've thought about uh, campaign finance reform. And in some ways, it's even happened in the courts and in the work of administrative agencies. Um, there is a justification for it, right? It's not crazy that citizens should want to know what's going on in Congress. But there's a difference between allowing citizens to know what Congress is doing and actually letting everybody see it happen. Um, and that difference, as your question suggests, is very hard to argue for. Uh, no politician wants to stand there and say, we just need some privacy, people. Leave us alone. That's not going to work, right? Um, and so I think that that's meant that we've had a very, very powerful forces pushing toward transparency in ways that have gone way past the point that they should have. Campaign finance reform has gone way too far. It's completely destroyed the power of the parties in ways that has done enormous damage to American politics. We need parties. The reason we have such intense partisanship now is that we have very weak parties. The parties do not drive extremism. The parties drive moderation. They want broad coalitions. And having weak parties and all the power going to these private groups that get to spend money outside the campaign finance system means we have a much more polarized political system than, you, than we otherwise would. And something similar is happening in Congress. It's very, very hard to compromise and bargain because nobody wants to be seen compromising and bargaining. And so transparency now is a menace. And that's easy for me to say, because I'm not running for office. 
it's very, very hard for a politician to say, even those who know it and see it. And I think a lot of members of Congress do. I'll give you an example. If you ask members what they like about their work, a lot of them will talk about the Intelligence Committee or the Armed Services Committee. And the reason is that those committees are not public. Um, they talk to each other across party lines. The Senate Intelligence Committee is easily the most functional committee in Congress. And it's because all of its meetings are confidential. Um, so I, you know, I, I think your question is the right question because that's the, that's the place where politicians find it very, very hard to make the case to their voters for the kinds of changes that might be helpful. Let's give a big thank you to our thank guests. You.